I graduated with a master's specialising in Islam and Arabic. Recently I've been writing a three volume works about Islam in America. This all led me to England. In this series I uncover the untold story of Islam in the UK. This year has highlighted the problems that we all encounter. Race riots, prison reform, the coronavirus pandemic. What have I learned and what can I take away? I thought of myself as educated about civil rights, about social progression, about liberal values. I still had a lot to learn. I'm still learning. Now, I've grown up and studied in London for years. I've got all of my degrees from here. I've travelled all over the capital in my research. It's taught me a lot about black thought that I didn't know, a lot about pan-Africanism. I'm still learning. This episode, we focus on Doozy Ali, an academic powerhouse he created within London. To understand him a little bit more, I've come back to my old university. The first stop is at the heart of London academia, SOAS. Doozy was a symbol of transnationalism. He was an Egyptian, living in London. He was part of the Anglo-Ottoman society. Robert Dannen has said Doozy should be alongside thinkers like Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, Muhammad Abdu as modern Islamic figures. But what makes Doozy special is not just the Islamic connection, he could be alongside thinkers like Blyden and Garvey as pan-African figures too. He was the son of a Mamluk military commander who then went on to become a successful actor. In 1911, he attended the first Universal Races Congress at the University of London. He then went on to be active in Islamic circles in London too himself. By 1912, he wrote the African Times and Orient Review. He wanted to promote the solidarity of non-whites worldwide. London thus became the hub of pan-African activity. Worldwide colonialism was afoot, in Africa and in Asia. Doozy constantly mentions the two in his articles. His subtle blend of pan-African activity went well with thinkers like Khwaja Kamaluddin. Together they collaborated to promote Islam in England. In fact, new research shows that when he went to America, he was active with the Ahmadiyya community there too. He eventually returned to Africa, but possibly his biggest accomplishment was yet to come. That in the form of his budding apprentice, Marcus Garvey. But where did all of that start? Marcus Garvey was a student here in London for two years. He worked under Doozy Ali. He became a journalist here. He saw how black Islam could work. He helped use that within his new organization in America. The UNA became the largest mass mobilization of African Americans in America. To this day, up to 100,000 members was the count. He had bakeries, restaurants, even the Black Star Line. Pan-Africanism seemed a real possibility amongst Irish nationalism, Zionism. African Americans were coming from fighting a segregated war back to fighting in a segregated country. What could they do? Then came in Marcus Garvey, then came the Urban League. His success came from a place of black unity. Race rights were still abound. Look at 1917. He published the Negro World and he generated transnational awareness. Then came Mufti Sadiq, arguably the most influential Muslim in the 20th century in the Western world. From what I can see of Mufti Sadiq's work, he was able to tap into black consciousness. He left a legacy in Chicago, the Midwest and the rest of America where he was able to do that. He landed in Philadelphia as a Muslim missionary but was thrown in prison. His effect was soon felt all over America. He delivered five lectures at the UNIA at Detroit converting 40 people which he has documented himself. Garveyites would even attend the mosque in their uniform. Doozy and Garvey realised the power of Afro-Indian cooperation. Garvey constantly talked about Gandhi. When Doozy spoke of Muslims, he said, if it is possible for Hindus and Mohammedans to come together in India, it is possible for Negroes to come together everywhere. To crystallise the point, take for example the case of Malcolm X. His father was a Garvey organiser, whilst his mother was a branch reporter for the UNIA. This part of my journey is over. I'm still writing and researching. What I have learned is though, London was a hub for Islamic and Pan-African activity. Who would have thought it? It all started from right here. What's amazing is it affected the whole world. Academics went from England to Africa to Asia to America and all in between. And it all started from right here.